Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. All right, so moving on to uh, my next wine here. Um, another screw cap, so we'll see if um, we'll see how it is. I've got the Moment app going. Um, I look a little weird, but then again, I think that I think the phone's actual screen is kind of the colors are kind of weird. I'm gonna have to check that out. I think I have it on True Tone, which kind of messes with me. Um, so we'll see how the Moment app works with, with this, with the color. Uh, anyway, so uh, let's get into this wine. Uh, so this is another 13. So I've got some older wines here. So these may not be available um, you know, for purchase, but just kind of get an idea that there's more recent vintages and you know, hopefully they're good. Uh, this is the 2013 Grey Wacky uh, Chardonnay. Um, this is actually from uh, Marlboro, uh, New Zealand. And... Um, so this one's kind of a, this was kind of cool. Uh, I got this off of Underground Cellar. Um, I paid eighteen thirty three. I don't know how I paid. I don't know how I paid eighteen thirty three for, but that's what I have written down. Uh, but valued at forty dollars. So let's see if um, let's see if I got lucky and this has uh, the larger. It actually kind of looks a little bit bigger. No, it's a standard one. So I'll have to vacuum in this one. Um, that's okay. Here we go. Throw the screw cap back on there. Vacuum in it in a little bit. Uh, anyway, so, um, I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, I'm not talking to you, Siri. <sighs> Does that happen to you too? Because, like, like if you, if you hit it just right and you press the button in, it Siri activates. I don't know. Maybe I should, like, stop that. Um, all right, so these guys. So let's let's uh, kind of talk about them. So uh, this is a label of a gentleman named Kevin Judd, um, and uh, he uh, he took the name uh, was adopted by him and his wife Kimberly for their first Marlboro Vineyard located in Rapara, named in recognition of the high prevalence of rounded gray wacky river stones uh, in the soils of the vineyard. Um, he registered the name in '93. And he said, with the vague notion that he might one day want to use it on a wine label of his own. So um, uh, he's he's definitely been in the industry for quite a while. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's just kind of talk about some more. It says quality focused. This quality focused winemaking venture sources fruit from mature vineyards within the central uh, Wairau plains and southern valleys. I never can pronounce those the New Zealand words right. Uh, these prime viticultural sites are cultivated using yield restricting vineyard management techniques and intense canopy management uh, regimes. A number of the vineyards are owned by the Sutherland family, while complementary grape parcels are acquired from additional selected sites, all located within those subregions. So um, he was a uh, actually he's also a photographer, and he makes other wines. So uh, let's see, he started his career. Um, well, he was born in England, grew up in Australia, and he studied winemaking at Roseworthy College and first made wine at Rinella in South Australia. Uh, he moved in New Zealand in 83, joined Selax uh, Wines. Uh, he became the founding winemaker at Cloudy Bay. So there's a name that you should know. Um, and then uh, say a pivotal role during which he directed the company's first 25 vintages. So he's, he kind of knows what he's doing, right? Uh, in 09, he established his own label, Grey Wacky, and um, let's see, it said alongside winemaking, he has also developed a parallel career in photography. For over two decades, his evocative images have appeared in countless publications worldwide, and he's also published two different books. One's called The Color of Wine, and the other one's called The Landscape of New Zealand, which that one came out in 09. Um, and then, let's see... Uh, 
Richard Ellis, uh, I believe is his winemaker. Uh, he's joined, he joined them in, uh, oh nine. Yes. No. He started with them in 14. Um, let's see here. And that's it. Now let's kind of go to the wine itself. Um, so said so the grapes, grapes for this wine are primarily sourced from low yielding Mendoza clone, uh, known for its concentration of flavor and crisp acidity. The balance were from Clone 95. Uh, the majority of the fruit was sourced from the lower reaches of the Brancott Valley and Fair Hall, grown in gravelly clay loam soils. The remainder coming from Rapora, grown in young alluvial soils containing high proportion of New Zealand's gray wacky. Um, all vineyards are trained on what they call two cane VSP, which is vertical shoot positioning trellis, which I mean, I can find a picture of that. Um, I actually did some over the weekend. Part of my studies was vin viticulture and so trellising systems, which the thing is like the, 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 the picture I saw of VSP was you couldn't really tell. It just like looks flat. It looks like it looks flat. So it doesn't look like, like you see, um, where the, where the, the vines are going along the, um, the wires, it looks more like flat. So that's, it gets as vertical, but it's, I see all the leaves. Uh, so I, I want to see what the, the shoots and the things look like. Uh, so maybe we can find a good picture of that. Let's see. Um, the vineyards were handpicked separately at high ripeness levels and whole bunch pressed using very low maceration press cycles. The resulting juice was uh, lightly settled and racked to French oak barriques, uh, which is 20% new. Um, they did uh, spontaneous indigenous yeast fermentation. Final phase continuing for many months. Uh, received occasional lees stirring, underwent a complete malolactic fermentation, um, transferred out of oak after 18 months and bottled. Uh, this was actually bottled in 2014 and then released October uh, 2015. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let's check out some New Zealand Chardonnay. So, this is another wine. If I stuck my nose in it, I'm like, it's absolutely Chardonnay because it is the only grape you get burnt popcorn from. I know it doesn't sound appealing, but man, burnt popcorn. So um, it doesn't say anything about like if it was a cool fermentation or warm fermentation. How I understand it, when you get that corn type of, whether it's like popcorn, burnt popcorn, cornbread, or just corn, when you get that aroma, it I understand how I understand it is a warm or hot fermentation. Um, what does that mean? Um, it just the fermentation goes faster, so you can get different you can get different um, aromas and flavors from faster fermentations versus slower fermentations. Um, I think if I remember correctly, the warmer, faster fermentations um, produce besides the corn smell of Chardonnay produce. Um, like riper fruit and more tropical stuff, whereas the cooler fermentations, uh, at least with Chardonnay, will say is gives you more of the citrusy lime lemon stuff, not as more of the tropical stuff. I might be wrong on that, but how I remember it, I think that's pretty much what it is. And it's also kind of smoky. Um, and, and honestly, for me, like. It's, that burnt popcorn aroma is one of those aromas that like over like overtakes my senses whenever I smell it in, in a wine. It's very hard for me to smell anything else. So there's a trick you can do if you're if you're if your nose is like kind of fixated on something or you're or you're having a hard time smelling something is to smell yourself. I know it seems kind of funny, but like smell your arm, um, especially if you're like wearing like a shirt, you you, know, you can smell that. So maybe I should do this. Ooh. Okay, and then kind of reset. So, I mean, it's overwhelming still. Maybe if I swirl, maybe some of that will blow off. I mean, there's almost like a caramel uh, quality to it. A little bit of apple, like yellow apple, but it's so subtle. And that smokiness, that popcorn... Yeah, um, 
That's that's pretty much what I get. So let's taste it, see what it's like. So it translates again to the palate. Very much the same thing. However, after the initial taste, that popcorn flavor starts like receding in the background um, and you're getting uh, non-popcorn flavors. Um, it's a touch of orange, um, but more citrusy, like non-orange citrus. And the acid is, is actually pretty high. I mean, I looked at it. It's a 6.5 grams per liter, which is kind of kind of high. Um, and considering it probably doesn't really have any um, uh, uh, residual sugar, because the alcohol is 14.5%. So they, they, they definitely fermented this stuff dry. And the pH is 3.39, which that means... So there's total acidity, and then there's pH. And while they're very much in line with each other, so in S, for acid... The number will go high for high acid and the pH the number is lower so the lower the pH the higher the acidity but pH only measures a certain kind of acidity not like total acidity and so he just says acidity is 6.5 grams per liter I'm assuming that's total acidity not tartaric uh, acidity but um, yeah but basically 3.39 is, is kind of low uh, or high, higher acid. You want to be in that 3.6-ish range. And even though it's only, what, 3.39 versus 3.60, so it's only 0.21, that's actually pretty big in pH scale because it's like a logarithmic scale. So every tenth is like a lot. Let's put it that way. Um, so yeah, that, that's a pretty low pH. So it's kind of pretty high acid. Maybe not as high acid as that, that Riesling, but pretty darn close. Now, as far as um, oak, there's more of a there's more of a roundness to it. I don't necessarily get like that overt oaky flavor. Um, there's more of a roundness to it, even though it's pretty high acid. Um, it was botanage happened, leaf stirring happened. Um, that also could be giving you more of that extra mouthfeel. I don't get like the normal like bready yeasty type of of uh, lees contact that you would get with lees. But um, Lee's a lot of times gives you more of a mouthfeel uh, rather than that, that pastry or bakery or pasta. Um, I've been using pasta water actually a lot recently because that's usually how I identify Lee's. Um, is it a good Chardonnay? There's definitely a market for this type of Chardonnay. It's not my favorite version of Chardonnay. Really just because of that burnt popcorn just kind of is a little over the top for me. Um, but it's, it's definitely... a New Zealand's a cooler climate. The fact that it's 14 and a half alcohol, it might be that that vintage was a warmer vintage or they just had some longer hang time on that so they really get the sugars up so they could get a higher alcohol wine out of it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the alcohol is well integrated. I mean, I, without looking at it, I would think this is like a 13 and a half at best on the alcohol. So alcohol is well integrated. It's just not my style. Um, but there's tons of people out there who love this. So, um, based upon how I described it, if those are the types of Chardonnays you gravitate towards, um, if this is pretty much as, if this is what most of his Chardonnays are going to taste like, then absolutely go for it. Um, let's see if there actually were some, all right, so let's, let's actually read the tasting note itself. A deliciously rich amalgam, I'll give you the richness because like around this to it, of pink grapefruit. Figs, baked apples, okay, kind of get that. Intertwined with more savory characters, redolent of meadow hay, toasted hazelnuts, buttered brioche. Maybe toasted something. The grapefruity and nutty savoriness pervades the crisp, dry palate while the power and concentration of the Mendoza clone creates an extraordinarily long finish that lingers and lingers. I'll give you that part. 
I mean, it lingers, but to me, it's more the acidity is what's lingering, not necessarily the flavors. Um, you know, hey, it just doesn't speak to me. Um, does, it's, it's a well-made wine. I, I mean, there's tons of people going to like this stuff. Do I get everything they say in there? Really, no. But maybe that's because this tasting note was written like right after it was released or right before it was released, and it's six years old, so things change. I mean, wines change. So, um, and wines go through weird phases too. Wines go through sometimes what they call a dumb phase. I know that kind of sounds bad, um, but they they go through this phase where, and I'm not saying this is where this wine's at, but they'll they go through peaks and valleys, and the valleys sometimes are quote the dumb phase, or they they don't they don't have as much life, and they don't they don't really speak to people as a whole. I know I said this doesn't speak to me, but and then you can wait like a month or two, whatever, or three months, and then all of a sudden the wine is just like singing. So wines can do that. Uh, especially when they've got some age to them. I said, is it a good wine? It's not my style, but you know, it's also not expensive. Well, I'm sorry, it's a $40 bottle of wine that I got for 18 bucks. Um, it's expensive and it kind of tastes that way um, based upon other wines in that 40 ish dollar range that I've had in the past. Um, and uh, like I said, people who like that style then do totally get it. If you don't like the style, then you know, maybe don't get it. Um, all right, that's going to do it for this episode. As always, click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below uh, about uh, the uh, Grey Wacky wines. Um, send some duckets my way to help pay for Oregon, which I think on this episode I will be leaving on Saturday because I think this is Thursday before I leave. And um, we'll see everyone again next time. <laughs>